This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. Be advised that the views and opinions of the hosts and guests do not reflect those of the station. We're uh, with uh, Mr. Sunny Africa. Should I call you doctor? You have a doctor? Sunny is fine. <laughs> Sunny Africa Sunny's of fine. Ibon, an uh, uh, economic uh, research uh, institution that has uh, gained uh, very, very wide uh, uh, respect uh, uh, from all uh, shades of the uh, ideological spectrum because of the very good economic work. Uh, unfortunately, of course, for every government, it is always critical so far of the government directions uh, in economics uh, because... Uh, generally, it has never been really pro-people, the government uh, economic policies. So uh, today we will uh, discuss the uh, national eco economy and then the global economy projections for the coming months and the years. Uh, let's start with the domestic. Um, what is your general assessment now? I know uh, you're not uh, uh, fully enthusiastic about the Duterte government's economic direction. Mm -hmm. What are these in particular? Ah, well, of course, first, thank you for the generous comments. Um, well, in terms of the way the economy is going, um, unfortunately, the last year has been very disappointing for us. Um, it was very nice to hear that the Duterte administration, when it was just starting out, um, was promising change. Um, he had a lot of nationalist rhetoric, um, both politically, in terms of independent foreign policy, but also in terms of revamping or overhauling Philippine economic policy. But actually, the early warning signs that that would not happen was the appointment of the um, neoliberal economic managers. Um, the DOF is always foremost in Philippine economic policy making, um, then followed by the DBM, actually distantly third by NEDA. But the fact that you had the three main economic agencies headed by diehard neoliberals was actually a, a problem for us. So I think a year later, um, we've seen two things. One, no change in economic policy compared to previous administrations. Um, actually, some reversals, which, which we can talk about later. But I think more importantly right now, to affirm that we really have to change economic policy, there have been some um, back backtracking back in terms of economic gains. Um, if in the last five years, actually since the early 2000s, um, if the last 15 years, and especially the last five years, have seen growing um, rapidly, uh, uh, sorry, relatively rapid economic growth, it's very striking for us that the last two quarters of the labor force have shown declines in employment in the Philippines. So I think it is a single indicator to show that there's an utter failure of these 15 decade, 15 years of neoliberal policies. And the continuation of these policies in the past year is the fact that in the last labor force survey, the Philippine economy lost, well, basically, I think 700,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem. Uh, I think if, if the Philippine government doesn't address that, that's, that's, that's going to be a big problem for us. Uh, I, I'll go to some particulars mm. um, along the uh, uh, descriptions you have uh, expressed. But um, uh, the, this question, however, uh, bothers me. Why is the popularity is, uh, of mm. President Duterte is still so high? At least in the last few uh, PEW, the American Research uh, uh, mm. Entity uh, Survey, he still enjoyed up to 85% support. Of course, this, let's say, in the past three months, there has been some decline. That's still substantial. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, this uh, lack of employment uh, opportunities uh, is already uh, felt uh, mm -hmm. down below? Uh, but I think we're, we're starting from a very low base. No? I, I think most Filipinos are inured to poverty, to unemployment. If there's an undercurrent of a demand for change, I think the fact that it has lasted for so long people are always trying to cope somehow. So, kumbaga, in that sense, since there hasn't been any um, major change from their difficult circumstances, 
what they're looking forward to right now is some kind of political change because of their dissatisfaction with the way the political system has happened. And in a, in very in a context where Philippine politics is very personalistic, Duterte is a very appealing, he's yeah. a very charming personality. He, his manner resonates, I think, with a lot of people who want that sort of um, paternalistic, uh, benevolent paternalism. So I think um, his popularity comes not so much from delivering economic gains, but from delivering the promise that things might might get better. But, but of course, the thing is, that also won't last. I mean, when, once people start realizing that um, this benevolent paternalism isn't delivering where it really matters, then I think that, that we're going we're, we're to have problems. Well, of course, we hear from you the uh, questions about the nationalist economic policies mm. versus neoliberal uh, and so on. Mm. But I think what people really re- respond to mm. is what they see day to day in terms of prices. Uh. That is what I really hear from people. Mm who may not really associate it with uh, Duterte's policies, but they feel uh, prices going up. Mm. Uh, you did not mention that, but in your studies, do you have some uh, conclusions there? Uh, well, right now, prices are actually quite low. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, inflation is still quite low. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one thing that the, the economic managers mm-hmm. are quite happy with. Mm-hmm. But also... Is it actually, due to actions uh, of the government or uh, the uh, natural, uh, you know, the decline in uh, oil prices, which was... Uh, uh, a global phenomenon. Uh, well, we think it's a combination of two things. Um, the more recurring reason for low prices is because there's low demand. Um, yeah, okay. If you have an economy with low purchasing power, uh, worsening um, unemployment, you will have that. You won't have that demand pull um, in terms of increasing prices. Secondly, very favorable global oil prices. Um, but I think it's good you mentioned prices because um, with the government's new tax reform package, That's right, yeah. even that last shred of um, things are not so bad mm. in terms of prices that's going to be disappearing well not immediately in 2018 but by 2019 that's going to be a, I think a time bomb for the Duterte administration his new tax package now if it's actually implemented that will increase price across the board for the poorest Filipinos who are not seeing any increase in their jobs or much less increases in their real income so I think we'll, that's we'll a, that's go a to the taxes uh, after this question uh, since I hear a lot about uh, a lot of complaints about prices, maybe I'm listening to the middle class and upper class, mm. where you know they have more uh, a, a greater variety of goods. Mm. Uh, uh, so maybe what you're saying is, uh, for the basic commodities, prices are quite low and stable. Is that is that correct? Is, are you saying it's also stable? Um, it's not because inflation yeah. is not really very high. I inflation say. in general is not very high, but even the price of basic commodities, you know, food. I mean, the, 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 the most basic. I mean, every day, the mama can't because mm-hmm. you can't afford them to stock up. I think the fact that um, food prices are still relatively moderate right now. I mean, even rice prices are still not dramatically mm-hmm. increased from a year before. Fish isn't that isn't much more expensive. Pork isn't. I think on a day to day basis, um, it's there's an affirmation that things are bad. But at least it's not so much worse than before. Mm. Well, another major factor in uh, inflation would be electricity mm. prices, you know, which uh, has been steady on the high side, mm. uh, not reflecting the decline in oil prices, so no, because mm. uh, uh, somehow the uh, the power generator uh, generation sector and the distributors find ways to mm. you know maintain the old prices, mm. which is generally still at uh, nine. 9 peso 80 per kilowatt mm. less the refund which will come back kick back in after uh-huh. the refund is paid uh, uh, and that is generally 40 percent higher than the ASEAN uh, average uh, electricity mm. uh, but but I think the thing is people don't feel differences eh, mm-hmm. with other countries we yeah. feel a difference from our current situation mm-hmm. if that changes that's what we feel and I think that's one thing working in the administration's favor right now that stimulus of a drastic change is still not happening. So it's true that um, Philippine power rates, even Metro Manila water, for instance, is among the most expensive in that's Asia. Right, that's right. You don't feel it being more expensive. You feel it now compared to a year ago. And I think right now, that's where the, um, the effect becomes more muted because mm. you get the expense, but because it's a high expense over decades, you actually feel the high exp- well. You feel the high expense in a fundamental sense, but you don't feel the change. Eh? And people react not to fundamentals, but they react to changes. Eh? So I think that's why again I have to go back to the the, the tax program. Yes, yeah. um, once they start lifting the VAT exemptions on power transmission, for instance, mm-hmm. I've heard the DFM computations. Power rates will increase anywhere from nine 
to maybe 11 to 12 percent, mm-hmm. but the maximum in the fat. So that will be filled. And yeah. I think once that is filled, on top of other um, increases in the price of goods because of um, uh, increased mm-hmm. oil taxes, then I think that's when the reaction yeah. will start happening. So let's let's move on. Uh, I have a commentary later on on the oil, uh, electricity, mm-hmm. and the oligarchy. But on the taxes, uh, you mentioned uh, some crucial tax. Uh, Deform- deformation, <laughs> yeah. you know, because they could keep calling it the reform. In fact, uh, during yeah. a media forum of uh, of uh, Bobby Di Ocampo, uh, who now heads the Philippine Veterans mm-hmm. Bank, and uh, has been over the past decades named Finance Manager of the Year, yeah. Banker of the Year, and so on, you know, uh, was uh, praising the new tax uh, reform again, the train. You know. mm-hmm. And I said, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, we've had three tax reforms and a half. The, the but. Mm-hmm. The expand you valid, uh, expanded value added tax, the RVAT of Recto, mm-hmm. uh, which was about the additional uh, excise or, or value added tax on fuel, correct? And then uh, this latest one, you know, and every time they promise no more new taxes. You know? mm-hmm. uh, and uh, well, he just went around in circles uh, trying to make uh, some answers that did not satisfy me. Because mm-hmm. why do we keep having these tax reforms now? Uh, what are the other? You mentioned uh, fuel, uh, electricity, or fuel prices. Fuel prices will be will add uh, nine to twelve percent. What are the other taxes? And uh, there's this a lot of talk about this uh, tax on sugar-based products or sweet. Is it sugar-based or just things that are sweet? Actually, um, the train it's without doubt the most comprehensive tax mm-hmm. deform package in Philippine history. Okay. Um, well, what makes it so uniquely... Uh, uh, I know. It's so comprehensive, comprehensive because it's actually a package of five. Mm-hmm. Um, it, train is a package... This, sorry, mm-hmm. train has five packages. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, the train in the Senate um, under deliberation right now is just package number one. Mm-hmm. Package number one has six main tax measures under it. Um, it changes the personal income tax mm-hmm. brackets um, it lowers donor and estate taxes. Yeah. It removes VAT exemptions. Mm. It increases oil taxes um, on previously untaxed diesel, for instance, and kerosene, but also increases taxes on the regular gasoline and mm. other um, oil products. It adds a, an unprecedented sugar sweetened beverage tax. Mm. Sugar sweetened, so that's very clear. They won't tax my stevia. Uh, <laughs> we don't know yet. You're, yeah, you're, you're stevia out is there. not sugar, yeah, you're out technically, there. Yeah, right? You, 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 you get liberated from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you put all that together, um, the personal income tax mm-hmm. changes, the um, estate and donor tax being lowered, the oil tax being increased, the sugar sweetened tax being increased, and the VAT being increased. Mm-hmm. There's never been a single tax measure that has tried to cover so much ground. And that's just the first package. Mm-hmm. Subsequent packages will reduce corporate income tax, will reduce tax on dividend incomes and on capital yeah. gains. Supposedly, it will also increase in taxes again. Supposedly, it will change um, taxes on natural resources. But the point is, there has never been such a substantive um, package of tax measures. And I think the reason si, um former Secretary Bobby De Campo was running around in circles is because there's no way to defend it. That's it's right, an oppressive yeah. tax package. Well, it's basically a tax package that the Department of Finance is scared to tax the rich, yes. so it's taxing the poor through higher consumption taxes. Yeah. The selling point they're stressing is that uh, personal income taxes for the working class will go down. That's such but, a lie. Of, of course, uh, that, so that's a lie. Uh, the other argument I've heard is that actually uh, the added va- VAT, uh, value added tax and excise taxes on fuel and other things will more than uh, increase uh, the cost of living of people that uh, the savings in uh, income tax would really be minuscule. Uh, actually, there are many deceits, I think, now about the DOF um, um, propaganda. But one of the biggest is that the working class benefits from the personal income tax. Um, right now, at most, five and a half to perhaps six million income taxpayers in the country. That means, more or less, 88, 90% of the labor force will not benefit from the income tax measures because that's about... Five and a half to six million income taxpayers out of a 44, 45 million labor so force. So these are the workers in the underground economy. These are not even workers. Will, uh, um, these are a lot of them are actually middle class yeah, and above. Okay, um, okay. So what the 
what the DOF is actually doing in terms, in terms of income tax reforms, it's making things easier for this very small middle class we have who do get the benefits from income tax mm-hmm. reforms, but actually also some of the very rich will actually get more money in their pockets from mm-hmm. the income tax reforms, while the poorest 88% who don't benefit from the income tax reforms will suffer higher taxes from the oil, from the vat, and uh, from the sugar sweetened yeah. beverage tax. Yeah, so it's, it's a yeah. huge deceit by the DUF to always say that the working class benefits from the tax package. Because in reality, 88% of the labor force does not gain anything from the income tax reforms. So just to keep things in perspective, we have around 25, mi- uh, 25 million families. Mm-hmm. This will only benefit 6 million families, uh, generally, the working uh, families. Uh, well, it'll benefit the more or less, five, actually it's 5.5 million, five million. According to the alpha list of the okay. BAR, it'll benefit maybe 90% of the this 5.5 million mm-hmm. middle income and above families. So that's only uh, 20% of the population. Uh, as you were saying, around 80 plus percent won't uh, benefit from this. Well, assuming they're distributed per family, yeah. More yeah. or less. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, maybe the cynical argument will be the 80% has no voice anyway. It's the middle class that counts. Uh, and I think exactly that's one of the, mm. I think, um, very good strategic choices of the mm-hmm. UAF. Mm-hmm. They know that the intellectuals, mm-hmm. the middle class, are actually very vocal. They're yeah. very noisy. So I think that's their sugar coating mm-hmm. for a very poisonous package. Mm-hmm. I think they were very smart to put it all in. Mm-hmm. Precisely, they want to have the propaganda value of benefiting the middle class would have made noise because the middle class is benefiting from this tax package. Mm-hmm. Essentially, you've neutralized what would have been the most vocal um, oppos- oppositors the other argument, of course, the government... Uh, offers is that uh, anyway we're going to spend this on the build 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 mm-hmm. that, that uh, roads trains uh, bridges mm-hmm. and this will uplift the economy uh, in general uh, what do you think ah okay that's deceit number two mm-hmm. you know, if deceit number one is claiming that the working class benefits from income tax reforms they don't deceit number two is that it actually goes back to them yeah. because uh, there's actually a smoking gun for that. Mm-hmm. Um, the 2018 budget that the government passed to the Congress um, in July actually already assumed that train would be passed. That's very presumptuous yeah. of them, but they have a supermajority. So they presumptuously assumed that train would be passed. So let's ask, did the 2018 budget reflect money going back to the people? It doesn't. Because mm-hmm. a budget that assumes train is passed we assess where the money is being spent. The biggest increase comes in infrastructure, which increased twenty eight percent. Social services, uh, meaning education, health, housing, actually only increased by about five and a half percent. The actual is a six to eight percent cut in socialized housing. Mm-hmm. There's a cut in the budget for public hospitals. There's a cut in the budget for preventive health care. Mm-hmm. And then, even if you consider that there are you know a few percent increases in mm-hmm. in social services, there's no different from the past tenth increases. Mm-hmm. So bottom line is, in terms of the allocation of where the new money is coming in, there is no difference mm-hmm. in allocation for social services. There's a big increase in allocation for infrastructure. And infrastructure, we have a major issue there. Um, if it's claimed that the infrastructure will benefit the poor, it's very striking. If you look at the 75 flagship projects, 65% of all the spending will just be in National Capital Region, mm-hmm. Central Luzon, and Southern Tagalog, which have the lowest poverty incidence in the country, mm-hmm. as opposed to regions like Arm and the rest of Mindanao and the Visayas, much poorer, they also get much less. So mm-hmm. It's very, very striking that if you look at where the infrastructure spending is, it's going to the richest regions of the country, not the poorest regions. Mm-hmm. It's going to big ticket infrastructure projects, which actually the most of the yeah. poor will not even be using. Mm-hmm. They can't afford the mega subway in, mm-hmm. in Metro Manila. Well, the subway I do not uh, subscribe to, but the other no. infrastructure I think will help. However, of course, uh, construction projects uh, are mm. uh, short-term uh, job boosters. Mm. Uh, also, I note that uh, there is an absence of uh, grassroots uh, uh, infrastructure, mm. such as uh, a municipal uh, power generation mm. uh, through uh, renewables such as... Uh, water impounding projects with uh, hydroelectric mm. potentials and so on. So, uh, yes, um, 
you're supposed to have an ideological sixty kin- percent of huh? like of the projects are just transport are yeah, just in rail. Mm-hmm. The, about twenty five percent from roads and bridges. Even mm-hmm. the flagship projects, you're talking eighty five percent just in transport mm-hmm. projects concentrated in already rich regions. Exactly, yeah. um, water projects, mm-hmm. um, renewable energy projects. They're nowhere at all. That's in the, right. That's right. Yeah. In the in the building. Well, you build. have a kindred spirit in Ebasco in the cabinet, and mm. uh, it's supposed to be in on the right side or left side of the uh-huh. president's uh, uh, chair. You know? uh, yeah. Isn't this reflected in Ebasco's uh, advice to the president? Ah, well, of course. Uh, is he is still a kindred spirit? Ah, well, first I think. His track record mm. in terms of having a bias for um, organized forces, mm. um, mass movement, I think that's actually quite important. Mm. But like you said, if he has the president's ear, mm. the president has two ears. Mm. Um, if he has one ear, mm-hmm. someone else has the other ear. Mm. And unfortunately, I, I don't think the ear he has is the ear that the president is actually paying attention to um, okay. in terms of crafting his economic policies, whether it's build, 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 or... Um, economic foreign policy. So I think that's actually very unfortunate. Yeah. We're going to take a break. But before mm. the break, I'd like to say that I've warned the uh, uh, supporters of President Duterte even during the campaign. It's the economy. Stupid yeah. if you don't pay attention to that and the people feel that prices will go up and their jobs are mm. uh, getting uh, lost. That's going to be Waterloo for this administration. Uh, we'll de- tackle that after this break. <music> 